but at the same time, like I'm, st I am stepping over a crack here that is deep and that you can fall into. It's black. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so here some some things change. The rope comes off, like we've been talking about, and the big thing is at this point, um, what I do for group managers, I say, okay, there's you know, Johnny here is the lead guide. Um, he's gonna be in front. Nobody pass him, please. And the, the other two guides are going to be tail guides and we're just going to be in the back. And it's not so much that nobody can fall behind us, it's more that I'm going to stay with anybody who starts lagging behind and make sure that they keep going. That lead guide is going to be turning around and kind of gauging how spread out the group is and it's their job to be like, okay, let's stop here and wait for five minutes or seven minutes for people to kind of come back together and then we'll keep walking again, we'll end up getting ahead. Rather than walking all the way down to here, which is where our, our break is, we take one break on the way down. Um, because at this point, you'll you'll probably be sitting here for an hour if you you know boogie down at your own pace and then wait for your group to catch you there. So that's something that you guys might be able to apply to things. You know, as sort of as a group management style, there are times uh, even here on Rainier where I just say you go at your own pace, do your own thing. But you know the guides are still setting the parameters, and they're kind of making the gauge of like, okay, the the only thing you don't want to do is end up having people sit for a really long time. It's not a big deal on a sunny day, but if it ends up being not a nice day, no one's gonna sit for an hour. They're gonna get up and they're gonna leave. Um, so that's that's sort of how we manage this part here, and that and then usually down here there's trail. But but again, we do the same thing. You know what I mean? And the guides will have radios and they can talk to each other like point to point. Uh oh. I'm running out of time. They can talk point to point and um, just touch the mouse. Just touch it. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. When you send it. It'll come back. Um, which is I don't know, you I mean that's maybe a little bit overkill for a uh, GMS trip, but it might be something you consider, you know, if you want to be able to have people just sort of be spread out, you know, it's not a big deal, and then you can have a tail guide, a lead guide, who then at least can talk to each other if there is a problem, like, oh. Okay, all right, so, I'll just keep rolling with it, and we'll, we'll see what goes. Okay, so he, this is, uh, <laughs> I, I made a long presentation. Um, this is a climb that a friend and I did after our first season guiding on Rainier and we were young and we were dumb and uh, but and we lived to tell the tale. So we did Ptarmigan Ridge which is one of the northern the sort of ridge routes, there's three ridge routes on the north of side of Rainier and we did it in the winter time and uh, so we did it alpine style. Um, we think it was probably the third winter ascent, we're not, I can't prove that but um, it's within the first five. <laughs> but it, uh, um, it was a traverse, that was the plan, was we were going to go up one side of the mountain and then come down the other, so we left the car on the other side. And we planned for three nights on the mountain. And this was the winter of 04, 05, and it was unique in the sense that um, we had a lot of um, cold, uh, well we had, we had some high freezing temps and a lot of rain that closed some of the ski areas early. Like they just didn't have snow in their base areas, you know. So like I think like seven thousand feet was the snow line, which is high. And that's in January, like or end of January, um, which is we did this yeah end of January, early February. Um, and so the volcanoes, the higher mountains, the elevations were just like the snow had just set up in this perfect <coughs> neve. I mean, it was super firm and hard, and uh, made for some really exciting climbing. So here's. Um, Here's Rainier again, and uh, here's our route. We started at some place called Spray Park. We drove right up to the gate of the park, and it, it's a dirt road entrance. It's not an entrance that we use. Um, and, uh, and then we hiked up. We spent a night out there, and then we spent a night here. And then this is kind of this is Tarmigan Ridge right in here. Here's Liberty Ridge, which you guys have probably heard of, and the Willis Wall, which is pretty infamous. Um, and here's the Emmons route that you guys may have been on, and here's the DC route down here. And so our plan was go up, climb Tarmigan Ridge, uh, maybe spend a night on the summit. So a night on the approach, climb the route, a night on the summit, and then down the Jib Ledges route, which is uh, right here. Um, and as it turned out, we spent, we spent one night down here, we spent a night here. We got on the route, we spent, we bivvied, so we didn't even, this, it was so steep in here that we ended up like excavating a, a chunk of, uh, just excavating snow out from underneath this rock. And it, 
Today is the worst day I've ever had. Um, it, it snowed all that night. We, we knew there was a storm coming, but we thought in our <laughs> infinite wisdom that this climb would go as, as fast as the DC route went all summer. And so, um, and we thought we were giving ourselves ample time to climb, you know, by spending a night on the summit, you know, we weren't even gonna descend the mountain on that day. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, the storm hit us when it should have, right when we expected it to, but we were here uh, when it did. And so that night, uh, Spindrift, we had our sleeping bags out, but no tent, and we were sleeping in a you know, hole in the snow, and the Spindrift just soaked our bags. And mm. so that, that decision haunted us the rest of the trip because we had wet down bags at that point. We then made miserable progress the next day in, in the face of the storm and camped in the only flat spot that we'd seen all day which, as it turned out, you know, like when I looked back and, and like did some research, some more research on the route, was it is one of the bivy spots on the the um, Mowich face here is this little spine. Um, and I, I don't have a picture of it, but it was it was pretty. I mean, we couldn't see anything in this storm. It was you know, like total whiteout, sideways winds. It's winter time, so you can imagine, you know, like eleven thousand feet. It's cold, right? I mean, it would be here too. Um, so we spent another night here, and things are starting to fall apart. I dropped my headlamp. Uh, at that point, my, my partner got frostbite um, on this day here. And, and we're from here to here, everything, we're pitching everything out. So it's two climbers, you lead out, set up a belay, belay me up, I come up, grab the gear, now I climb up, set up a belay. You know, it's like slow progress, right? And uh, we were getting really cold belays and not eating and drinking, which is what we blame. I, I, I managed to get enough food and water in not to get frostbite, and we think that my partner got frostbite because he just, at some point, just decided he wasn't going to eat and drink anymore. And, um, so anyway, so it, you know, those sort of things have ramifications. And uh, so, and this, I, the next, the morning we woke up here, so we got here in the dark, um, couldn't see a damn thing, set up the tent. Uh, you know, just so happy to be in the tent, out of the wind at that point. And um, next morning, wake up, and the cloud bank had dropped. And so now it was the first time since, that we could see something since, since the storm had started. And you know, I can just see the top of Rainier, and it's just everything's coated in rime. And and finally, I can see where we're going. You know, like oh, there's the route, and there's this cleft, this break in this rock cliff that you go through. And there's ice pouring down it. Yeah, it was just, it was awesome. And that was the last, and so we had basically had two pitches out of camp and we were up on the um, Liberty ice cap here. And from there on, it's, it's glacier climbing, you know, so it's like, okay, we're both moving at the same time. We're both staying warm because we're both moving. Um, and, and pretty smooth sailing. We spent another night here. Um, then we summited and, uh, and we had a radio that we had picked up from RMI. Um, and so we were, at this point, here we called my partner's uh, girlfriend, and we're like, oh, yeah, well, things are taking a little longer than we thought. And, yeah. <laughs> no, no, everything's not really okay. We just has frostbite, and you know, da, da, da. and so, um, so by the time we got here, I don't know. Well, definitely by the time we were on the summit, we were in radio contact with the park service. Um, a rescue operation was kind of underway, and you know, it's like, yeah, it's full on, right? And, and the storm's still going. You know, when we climbed up this day, the, the clouds came up, and we were back in a whiteout by the time we got up here. Um, you know, this was just like Shangri La. It was so awesome. It was flat, the wind wasn't blowing quite as hard. It was like, oh my god, we're safe, like, we're not gonna die. Um, and you know, yeah, we get up here, and then, and, and so, okay, so both this camp and this camp. I am trying in the tent, with the tent, or with the map and the compass, trying to figure out what bearing do I have to walk off the summit from here to get to here. Because this, there's no landmarks in here. I need, I'm going to need a bearing to walk that line. We can see where, our, the red line's our actual route. Um, so I got it wrong, basically by the declination. I just, I, in my mind, I couldn't. I was like, is it east, is it west? And, like, and then, and, but it's opposite, right on the so, because I, I didn't have a compass that you, where you can set the declination, you have to, you know, figure it in. Well, I took, I took two nights, you know, of preparation, not at home with a cup of coffee, but on the mountain while I'm getting hammered, trying to figure out, you know, how to get off the mountain, right? So lesson learned is 
figure that stuff out before you get on the mountain, right? Um, so I got it wrong. You know, the other thing that could have happened is we had, this was a whiteout when we were up here. We thought we recognized that we were at the landmark called Guides Rock where we'd pop up on our summit climbs off the DC. I don't know if we really were. I have no confirmation. There's not like a plaque there that says this is Guides Rock you know, or, or a bolt or something. Probably looks different in the winter. It looks different, you know, I mean, I, I, I couldn't see the whole crater either. So it's not like I saw the whole crater was like, oh, yeah, well, okay, if that's, you know, you know, like there's just, yeah, and no footprints, nothing. Rainier is a different animal in the wintertime. Anyway, um, headed down this way, and, you know, we're, we're walking the bearing, like literally, you know, compass in hand, walking the bearing. Nice straight line. Um, had to enter a couple of crevasses, come down here, oh, rocks on our left, perfect, that's just like we expected to find here, <laughs> except like, yeah, nope, things aren't quite right, you know, and then we wrap around um, the, the rocks here, we're looking down this face, and we're like, holy shit, like, this, is, this is big, this is, the, this is the Nisqually Ice Cliff, this is the Nisqually Cleaver here, and the Nisqually Ice Fall, and this thing is steep on this side, and it's a big rock thing, and basically, I, so I pull out the compass, and I'm like, okay, well, what aspect am I on? And because I, I didn't make sense that I would wrap around quite so far. Gibraltar Rock, I should just come in, traverse along the, the ledges, hit this ridge, and follow the ridge down, you know, all the way down to Camp Muir right here. And instead, I'm looking, you know, because I have my compass out, I know I'm looking due east. And that means I'm here looking this way, and it doesn't look anything like this, because I know what this looks like. Um, so we know we're lost, my, my partner and I. But we have the radio, we're talking to people, and it's like, at this point, uh, yeah, so a detail, we finished our last two fruit leathers here for dinner, um, and we ran out of fuel. So we have no water uh, and no more food this day. You know, things are looking grim, it's not, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, we, um, we made a rappel. We, we basically were cliffed out at this point. And we, we just kind of knew that we needed to be going downhill. So we made a rappel and that committed us to the descent. There was no way we were going to reverse it. And we, we actually ended up, made, we had to make a rappel and a half, um, which is a sort of story in its own. Anyway, we go down this thing. It is epic, I'm telling you. Like, I, this is the part. So the, you know, again, lesson like the unplanned blind descent down, you know, some face in a whiteout like that you've never been on, just not where you want to be. You know, like it's just not where you want to be. And I'm, I am lucky to be here, uh, yeah. you know, out of this section right here. So, but we also were in radio contact with people. Um, we know that there's people yeah, here at Camp Muir who are waiting for us and like, man, we are just, we're ready to get down. So motivation got the best out of us. And there was just no way that we were gonna go back up like here and try to figure out, you know, where we were and that sort of thing. So we just, we went down. Um, and I'll save you some of the details of that for another time. We get down here, we cross this thing, and we finally see some headlamps down here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Ptarmigan Ridge. This is the climbing route. That's the Liberty Ice Cap Cliff or something like that. Um, the route goes uh, across this glacier, and then you go up here like this. In, in good conditions, like where you're just walking, you know, like it's steep, it's 45 degrees. But that's, you know, like if you can get any purchase in your feet, kick steps, this will take you two hours. This took us all day right here. And this is the, the rock we bivvied under right here. This right here, this is the, the chute that kind of is infamous for Tarmigan Ridge. And this is probably more like 50 degrees. And when it's firm, it feels real steep and it ends in this cliff right here. So it definitely feels exposed. So this, this was exciting, and there's tons of spin drift rolling down this. And then you have this decision: you can either go left around this side, or you can go right, which we did. And then you, uh, this is where we had our other camp, where we were able to set the tent up. And then you climb through a break in the rocks here that usually has ice in it and stuff, and it's exciting. And, and then you get up here, and then it's pretty smooth sailing all the way up to Liberty Cap. Um, so yeah, so that's a picture of the face. And this is kind of looking down. You can sort of see. Um, looking down that same face, you can sort of see how shiny things are. That's that's because that's it's ice, you know. It's not blue ice, but it's icy snow. It's yeah, like you, anything that hits that is just going to accelerate. It doesn't doesn't dig in at all. And there's yours truly, um, pretty scared at that point. And then here, I don't. That's pretty washed out. But can you guys see his fingers at all? Mm -hmm. You can see they're kind of white. 
I don't see him myself at this point, but his tips are basically all white. And it, uh -huh. it's foggy because um, of all the, the um, condensation that's coming off of us once we got in the tent. So this picture was taken at that, um, that second divvy. And then this is the way down. And this uh, is probably the summit here. Here's Gibraltar Rock. Camp Muir is down around the corner here. Uh, this is the Nisqually Cleaver. And this is the day after we came down. So, so okay, so here's the other thing. So the storm rolls in uh, and deposits, oh, probably close to two feet of snow on top of all of that firm, icy snow. And it, like, coming down this thing was epic. Uh, repelled off of this cliff up here and just like, I don't know what, came down through here somewhere, I think, came out here. And actually, you can see our trail right here. That's me and my buddy. Um, yeah, and so this thing, this is the Nisqually Ice Cliff, which, which calves, is very active. It calves off all the time. This is not a place to hang out. We didn't know we were there, like, really. I mean, <laughs> we just, we knew we came off a really steep face and we had to get away from it. I heard this come down behind us. We were probably somewhere in the neighborhood here. I, I was close enough that I kind of ex expecting to see like chunks of ice like rolling out of the darkness around us. Um, one headlamp. We lost our rope here. Like, I mean, things were just falling apart. So bad. So, but I, I, I have, you know, I'm still really good friends with my partner to this day. We, we talk all the time and, you know, it's, it's this memorable climb but it's also this, this moment of like, uh, okay, so these are all these things that you don't want to do, right? Like, um, you, these, this is what happens when you push yourself and you don't have a good plan. Um, you don't have the experience to do these things. You know, we, the lesson was we got what we asked for. You know, we, we got on a big route, inexperienced, with not enough equipment and time, and we didn't have the training and the skills um, to know how to use that, the equipment. And, uh, and this is, yeah, we, we got out of it just by a kind of, um, you know, tenacity or whatever. Okay, that's his Denali 2006. Um, it's carved out of snow, and that just gives you an idea how much time people spend at these camps. This is at Camp 14. So the weather rolls in on in Alaska, and it's not two or three days like on Rainier. It's, it can be weeks. Um, I mean, some of this stuff just looks a little washed out. This is, this is the Alaska Range. This is Denali. Um, this is Forker and Hunter over here. And then you can see this from Talkeetna, which is where you fly into. So um, again, you know, basically the idea here is, all this stuff, I'm sorry these things don't look that good. You land here, here's the summit of Denali, and I kind of, I drew in a red line in here. This is your route. And then you reverse it. <laughs> and is you that land the here. standard route? Though? That's the standard route, this is the West Buttress. You land here because of this arbitrary line right here, <laughs> which I, I just think is funny because when you're coming back, it sure would be nice if they landed right here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's all your gear, and just to give you an idea of prep, you know, trip preparation. Um, you know, tents get set up, and this is the hangar, the landing area in Talkeetna. Tents get set up. You make sure everything works in the tent. There's no missing poles. All the guidelines are in there. This is your food. Everything is packaged into bags, like man days. So one bag is one day's food for the whole group. And then this, each one of these is each person's gear, which we do a gear sort. We go through everybody's gear, we weigh it. You know, like this is the time to weed all the extraneous stuff out. Uh, <laughs> then you fly on here. And this is the Talke or this is Kahilta, um Glacier here, and um, this is uh, Ski Hill. Have any of you guys been up to, to Denali? My husband has, and we have a video of it. Yeah. So, did you guys do a video ever? I didn't, no. If you ever want to see it. <laughs> I do, I love, I love Denali. I think it's, it's just, it's an awesome place. Here's Camp 14 where that Denali snow sign is. Um, West Buttress route, uh, there's the, the actual feature where it gets its name from. Windy Corner, that, the initial picture in the, the show is from, um, right there. And then you can see here some camps. This is your high camp and, uh, and the summit right here. And if you guys are familiar with the Cassine Ridge, that's right here. And the West Rib is this route right here. Uh, here's the Wickersham Wall. It's one of the biggest walls in North America. I mean, I don't even wow. know, it's probably 14,000 feet of continuous fall line. Um, pretty amazing. It's been climbed too. 
Here's a, a not a summit day on Denali. Uh, this is taken from High Camp, and this is, this is you know when I was telling you that I, we we called a trip on Denali. This is where the avalanche conditions were. There's a traverse that goes here called um, the Autobahn, and and we explored a secondary route in here, and then decided this, that that was not. It just wasn't up. It was above the, the level that our clients were operating at. It just was not the same climb you know, that we set out to do. But that's that's an extreme wind. Um, top there. And there's a hunter from up high on Denali. Just amazing, amazing wow. green. This is, um, this is me uh, on a rope and this is sun projection because it uh, just cooks you up here. And, and I'm a fair skinned guy. I, I just, I get burned. And when you're on that mountain, you, you don't ever get respite. So you, you don't, like, you, once you get burned, you're burnt. And it's just going to get worse because the next day you're going to be out again. Um, so I routinely, you know, I have like 70 block on underneath that too. Why the flagging? So, okay, good question. So these are wands, and, uh, and that one right there is a cash wand. It has the name of our expedition and oh. date and stuff on it. But, uh, you know, wands are for marking your route on glaciers where you, there's no uh, landmarks. And the snow can easily get blown over, and so you lose all sight of trails. So, um, if, you know, like here's some clouds rolling around. In 30 minutes, those could be up, and we could have no idea where we are. And so, having wands out helps us mark the route. Um, here's somebody on the fixed lines on Denali, looking cool. Um, he's got his Everest boots on, and he's got his ascender here. He's shimmying up the road. This is the top of the fixed line, so it's you know not particularly steep, but um, it's a cool shot. And uh, here's here's uh, this is this is the, the approach up to the fixed line. So you go up through here, and the fixed lines kind of run up through here, and then the route goes up the top of this ridge here to high camp. And this is an avalanche that, that happened to start uh, as I was taking this picture. I don't even know why I was wow. taking this. Not, not, nothing particularly interesting going on here. Um, <laughs> some climbers, you know, here. And, That's uh, called the auto up there. No, this is this is the approach from fourteen thousand feet. Uh, up to the fixed lines, and then you go up this ridge here to high camp, oh. and then the autobahn starts up there. Okay. Yep. Uh, sorry, I'm just I'm kind of I'm realizing that I uh, <laughs> I've got more information here than, than we have time for, so I'm going to sort of run through this. This is my favorite spot on Denali. This huh. is on this ridge here. Uh, this is at 10 a.m. in the morning, and it, the sun never sets this time of year, uh, so this is like 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and the sun is now on the opposite side. This is where the fixed lines are, this aspect, and Camp 14 is here in the shade. And, um, is this in May? This is in, um, this is in June. Ah. Yeah. And this, this, yeah. So this is the West Buttress, this ridge here. Um, and there's Fort in the background. Wow. It's just amazing. And on a clear day, you can see the tundra out here. It's just like, oh my god. It's, so cool. Okay, we fly all the way, halfway around the world, down to South America. This is Aconcagua. Whole other style of trip here, right? Um, expedition, this takes three weeks as well. But now, on the three-day approach into high camp, or base camp, rather, which is right up here in this rock glacier, you get all of your gear gear uh, carried in on the backs of mules, and then you walk along the day pack um, for three days. And, and you don't really follow these guys. I mean. They have their own schedule. They do their own thing with, with the, the, the these guys here, the, the cowboys, um, and uh, so you you know in the dust all the time. But they'll pass you these trains of, of mules, and they're bringing supplies up to base camp and stuff. But you can there's coolers on here, and then these these bins have gear in them because they don't get crushed, you know, because they help protect what's inside there. But um, you can send real food up to base camp, you know, eggs and things like that. Um, a lot of times they make it up. <laughs> Sometimes it's a mess. Akka was another really cool mountain, and the, the standard route. This is the Polish glacier here. So the Polish direct um, or the Falso Polako uh, is goes up this glacier here, which I haven't done. That would be really interesting to do. It's, it should be cool. And so so Denali, for a relative just comparison, is a little over twenty thousand feet. This is um, uh, just under twenty three thousand feet, and it makes a huge difference. Uh, the different uh, that couple thousand feet elevation gain as far as how you feel up here because we don't use oxygen on either of those mountains. Um, and this is a rock glacier here that you go up so the route kind of goes up here up there. What elevation is the eight thousand feet level in feet just comparatively? Um, Twenty four thousand. 
Oh, for 8,000 meters. 8, yeah, 8, meters. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. 24,000 feet. Yep. Yeah, so, so Amitabh is a great place to go if you're on your way to the Himalayas because you're going to do it without oxygen and, uh, and you'll get a real feel for you know, what, what life is like up, up high. Um, this is uh, Edith Cavell in the um, Canadian Rockies, and uh, I think that's brilliant French there. So just sort of an idea of like styles of climb, like a uh, pretty wow. big route here. It has some fifth clients climbing in it. We've got an ice axe here. There's a rope in the group, and we have a group of six people that we're going to get up this route as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll save you some of the details, but you know we're in um, capris or whatever. And, <laughs> T-shirts, and uh, here's my wife Jenny. You know, shorts. Uh, gorgeous day. Nothing on the horizon. We got tiny little day packs, and you know, we scoot up this big ridge um, without much of uh, a safety net. Same trip down to the Bugaboos. Uh, lots of weather rolling around, glaciers, um, and a day like this, where it definitely seems iffy and marginal. What's it going to do? It could very easily and realistically turn into this, which uh, was snow here, and then um, became rain uh, once we got down on the glacier. So now we're in a whiteout. You need a navigation plan if you are unfamiliar with the area and want to get around somewhere, because there's definitely lots of cracks around. So, you know, very different volumes. You kind of need to know what you're playing with. Uh, same climb here, uh, just sort of a, a, I don't know, an example of good glacier travel and crevasse crossing technique, like not a lot of slack in these ropes here, right? And she's getting ready to cross this bridge here. You can sort of see where um, somebody clambered up over here. And this thing, you know, it's pretty big, but uh, I, I don't know, crevasse crossing is always just sort of like you, your stomach's in your throat or whatever, you know, you got butterflies because it's like, God, like, I, you know, you don't know, yeah, and, it, and it, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, also, Bugaboo is just, just a cool picture. Um, Pigeon Spire here. Just, yeah. Bugaboos are amazing. If you guys haven't been up there, it's highly recommend going up because it's cool. <laughs> okay, style matters. What well, you can see this, this is going on, right? You guys, all right, we'll, we'll stop in 15 minutes. Um, so, trip planning. Okay, so part of what this is uh, with this presentation is um, I use route plans for these reasons. And as a professional, I use it for liability and accountability. If something happens on a climb, I can show somebody, here's what, here's what I did, this was my plan. I didn't just walk out here and wait, you know, and just expect something to happen or not happen. In my personal climbing, I've used route plans to um, do climbs like Edith Cavell, where I felt like, okay, I've done a time calculation. I can do this route at a normal pace in eight hours. I think I can do it faster than that. And I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do it faster by taking less gear, you know, I'm gonna take these chances. Um, so I've been able to sort of up the ante by being able to set out a detailed uh, route plan. Um, sets incremental goals so you can work towards things, you know, in smaller steps rather than it's only the summit, that's where I gotta get to. And now it's like, okay, I gotta get to the top of this ridge and I need to do it in this many, you know, hours or this many minutes. And if I'm not doing it, then I know that I'm not on pace to do this faster set. Um, and it spends time visualizing the climb, and that's something you do at home. Like, okay, you know, I mean, literally, like pouring over the guidebook, uh, you know, sitting there with the topo, just trying to like imagine, like, okay, so what's this going to be like when I get here? What's going to happen? What's the stream crossing going to be like? Where am I going to put my crampons on? Will I need boots for this? You know, sort of those kinds of things. Um, Factors that affect pace when you're doing a route plan, terrain. So you need to account for differing terrain, right? Um, are you gonna be on trail? Are you off trail? Like, are you bushwhacking, right? A lot, big difference when you're bushwhacking and when you're just following the trail and beating, beating the trail down with your shoes. Are you in the dark? Um, is it in snow? You know, are you gonna be post-holding? Uh, or are you on skis? And can you just shush down, you know, something that would take you four hours to walk down, you're going to do it in an hour. Um, this, the angle, you know, how steep is the slope? Do you have to get a rope out? You know, is there glacier travel or steep snow climbing that you need? You know, once you pull the rope out, things slow way down. Uh, like, thing, it goes to like kind of half your pace. So if you were doing 1,000 feet an hour before and you pull out the rope, you're now, I guarantee you're going to do 500 feet an hour, if that. Usually when I do um, pitch climbing, yeah, I don't, it wouldn't even, it goes way slower than that. If I do pitch climbing, I 
I estimate 30 minutes per pitch. And that means somebody, we went from standing next to each other at a belay to one person leading up and me standing next to them again in 30 minutes. And that's, that's at most like a, um, you know, a, uh, a novice climber would easily take an hour to do that. But with training and practice, half an hour is very doable. And you can do it faster than that if you start cutting some corners too. Um, the other thing that affects your pace is people. And so this is where taking care of your people comes in to play again. You know, you so get tired they get. Uh, so, you know, things like physical conditioning, you know, that, that's something you're, that's just going to come out in the, in the work or as you're going, uh, but it's something that you might want to try and sort of uh, figure out ahead of time, like get a read on when you first meet people or you're talking to them on the phone. Um, you know, are they tired, are they hungry, are they dehydrated? How much weight are they carrying? I, weight kills people. Um, it's just, oh my gosh, they just go slower and slower. So if you can, like, ditch a couple of things out of their pack, put them in your pack if they have to come, or, you know, if you're close to the summit, it's like, okay, let's go get the summit, and then we'll come back down here and take a break next to the pack, and we'll leave our packs here, rather than carry them all the way up to the top of the mountain. And sometimes that extra 500 feet of not carrying the pack can make the difference between, you know, saving some energy and stuff. Um, skill level, you know, is just, you know, like how, how proficient are people at walking? I mean, boy, you know, one of the things uh, that I, with, with my clients on Ring Year especially is, you know, not knowing where people come from, like what their background is. Um, you know, our day-to-day -day lives are very different than what our lives are like and what, um, what life is like in the mountains. You know, it, uh, you, you, okay, so, here in town, you're in your car, you're talking on the phone, you know, like I expect emails to go through instantaneously, I want a response by the end of the day, you know, I, like I've accomplished 30 tasks this day, you know, and, and I got all this stuff done, and you know, like things happen fast, like I get instant gratification. That is not the case when you get out in the mountains. It's like gratification needs to be, it's, it's an art form, like you have to be satisfied all the time. And then you're happy even when you're walking up the mountain and not just at the summit. And some people don't even know that. Some people just have a hard time getting into that mode and some people don't and it's just super easy. Um, but, you know, it's something that, that I, I kind of like to prep people for like, okay, so we're shifting gears here. We're, you know, putting on a new hat. We're like, this is a different world. You just have to, like, there's new rules that you need to understand. We need to be patient. We just need to, you know, understand that. Um, okay, so decisions about your trip. So macro, mini, and micro decisions. Um, macro decisions are things that you're gonna, you're definitely gonna make at home. Uh, where we're we gonna go, what what mountain do I want to climb, what valley do I want to explore, and how you know how are we gonna do it? Like, so do I just need you know some clothes and lunch and a water bottle, or do I need more than that? Mini decisions. Um, are things that you want to have considered at home, things that like, you know, route decisions of like, okay, well, um, you know, I think the route description says, you know, in Edwards it says take this ramp um, when, you know, but I know from experience that I may not find that ramp, so what else looks like, you know, something I might be able to do? That's something that you might ask yourself at home, and then when you get there, you know, it might be more obvious, like, oh, that's the ramp, or that might be the ramp, but that looks a whole lot easier, or, you know, something to that effect. Um, and then micro decisions are things that you can only make when you've already made these decisions. Um, and that's because you have to be, these are decisions that you make in the moment. Um, there are decisions that, you know, they just they happen instantaneously. So, and you need to be um, secure and confident enough in these decisions to be able to make these decisions. So this is the decision that like, you know, is gonna uh, launch you into self-arrest when somebody falls to catch him. You know, like, like Don's experience on Rainier. Like, that's something that you had already made all of these decisions. You were confident and secure in what, where you were at that moment on the mountain to be able to do this and to react quickly to something. And it's not just for emergency decisions. It could also be like I've got here, should I put my foot here or over there? Like, so I'm, I'm envisioning a rock climb, like am I gonna use this little ledge or that one? You know, like it's something that I'm doing very focused in the moment. I'm no longer thinking about these things. Um, so the, are you gonna start the night? Um, that's a, an important consideration. Things take longer in the dark. 
guaranteed. So if you're doing a pre-dawn start, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, I just needed an extra hour, so I'll, you know, I'll just do an extra hour in the dark. I would budget an extra two hours in the dark. Um, so this is, this is me and my wife uh, on the Hope route, and this is just an emergency bivouac in the Alps. I mean, this thing is hooked wow. up. Blankets, mattresses wow. with springs on them, a cool wooden table, um, books. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, everything was here. And uh, this is an unmanned hut, you know, up on the mountains. Well, if you know that these things are out there, that, you know, like now you, now you can plan this into your trip. And, you know, that the one thing we did on this particular trip, we took way too much stuff. That was when we learned. <laughs> In the Alps, you just don't need as much stuff. But it was still a great trip. Um, so, okay, so here's an example uh, of a route plan that I did for um, doing the Grand Teton in a day with my wife. And this was um, the summer after our daughter was born. So this is, this was quite an accomplishment, I think. I'm, I'm real proud of you for having been able to be able to do this. But basically, um, what I've got here is I've, I've got some legs, and I've, even, you know, I've built in my brakes here when I want to do there, uh, shoes and water. Um, and the distance, the change in elevation, and I've changed everything into metric, because the system I use works with metric. And then this is the time calculation. I'll show you guys how I got that. And then this is the actual time from the trip. And this is to the summit, so it's just the way up. So 12 hours, basically 12 and a half hours one way. It's a long freaking day. Uh, and we're starting early, right? Like we're definitely starting like in the dark. I think we probably started at three in the morning or something, um, and didn't get back until you know basically dark. Uh, but amazing to me, anyways, is that we're like within you know ten minutes of each other, of our estimated time. And so let's see. So what so what happened? So some things took a lot less time than I thought. Um, here's you know this was probably going to be. A, 15 minute break and ended up being a two minute break. This was, so this is on trail, it was just super easy and we were fresh and just, you know, moving. And then into Garnet Canyon, you know, I thought it would take an hour and 15 minutes. So I'm being conservative here and uh, it only took us 40 minutes. And then we didn't take a break because uh, there's a zero there. And then to the meadows took us a little longer than I thought. But we built some time into the bank, right? And now shoes and water. So that was basically we we were hiking up in tennis shoes and when we got to the snow we were going to change into boots and we need to fill up with water. Because part of the way of being able to move quickly is not water is heavy, so you know figuring out how you're going to fill up with water throughout the day is, is kind of a, a clutch. Um, so that took more time than I thought it was going to, which is understandable. Uh, then to the, to the lower saddle was real close. Um, and again, you know, breaks are taking longer. We're taking 20 minute breaks instead of 15 minute breaks. Uh, and uh, a little longer. So in Wall Street, on the, this is sort of where the, the real climbing starts with the rope and stuff. And we got lost. Um, uh, well, I got turned around. It wasn't really lost. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, uh, a classic guy. Who, we, uh, we, we, so we, anyway, there we go, 15 minutes, blah, 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 four hours. Oh, so yeah, that was even a little longer too. And, and I remember this, it was just, it, it's a big route. Neither one of us had done it before. And so um, this, uh, climbing up the upper exit, is, it just, it goes, you know, it's a big mountain. It just it goes and you get tired and you get more slower and slower and slower. Uh, so the descent, I, you know, mapped out the time for that as well. Because, um, you know, we needed to know how early were we going to wake up to make this actually happen. Um, and, and some, you know, there's a lot of other things you might consider with just where you want to be in the mountains at what time of the day might, you know, dictate when you start a climb like this. Um, so, you know, again, and here we're an hour longer, so, you know, we were 12 and a half hours, you know, plus, you know, we were close to 20 hours round trip. It's, I mean, these are, doing the grand a day is super fun, um, and just to give you an idea, like, I, I have I've done the Petzolt Ridge, which is a longer, more technical route with Brandon French um, in, I think we were six hours to the summit. It's, you can do it, I mean, you can do it faster than this, but doing it in a day is really fun. It, like just moving all day through all that different varied terrain is it, just, it's, 
it's exciting. Um, and, and you're super tired at the end of a 20 hour day. <laughs> So, okay, so that's that. Here's how I figure it out. Um, I have to convert to, uh, mainly it's meters. Distance, you know, I just measure my distance in kilometers, and then I gave you guys conversions here. But, and the idea was, and, I, and I, I, we're, we're definitely out of time, but um, the idea was that I was gonna have you guys do a quick uh, route plan for Heaven's Peak, but we'll just sort of talk about it real quick, and you guys will get the gist of it. And if you guys want afterwards, if you wanna talk a little more about it, that's fine, but I'm not gonna. Chain you guys down. Um, well, let's see. Okay, so so here's here's how this works. So uh, meters you do have to convert because almost always your elevation um, contours are going to be in feet in the U.S. And uh, so I do three. I basically I do 3.3 feet that I round up. Um, and uh, and then so for the the way up you want to the way this works is so for every kilometer of distance you travel you create a unit. One unit. So if you if your leg is, you know, three kilometers, that's three units. And then for elevation gains, every hundred meters gives you one unit of elevation. The units are things that you can add together. So for a thousand meters, you've got ten units, right? Does that make sense? And then you would add those two together. So you'd have in three kilometers and a thousand meters, you'd have thirteen units. You divide thirteen by four. And then if you need to, you can multiply by 60 to get your time in hours, but, but usually it's pretty self-evident. It's like, okay, what's well, close to half? And I always round up. Just give yourself the buffer. You, you know, we're not like, this isn't in German engineering here. We're, we're talking about people and time, so it's give yourself the extra time. Um, so, uh, and then on the way down, you divide by 10. And it, it, you know, it basically roughly equates that you, you get half the time. Um, any questions about that? I, I've never taught anybody math successfully, so I don't expect it to happen tonight. <laughs> but uh, but it's an attempt. And, and I was really psyched learning this formula. I, I learned this through the AMJ as well. And, and even though it has this, the conversion part, which is a little bit of a drag, um, I just find it it works. It's very accurate. It, it just it works. So could you just go on the website? And this no, you can't, but you can go to Northwest Mountain School, um, and that's a, a couple, John and Olivia Race, uh, who I've guided with a lot, and they have um, a blog entry about route planning, and it's super descriptive, and yeah, it's great. And they also talk about how to use uh, Super Topo, or the Topo program, which is how I generate all the maps for this show. Um, and you can do route plans right to there. It gives you an elevation profile. It's, it's in um, Blake's book. He's got the, if you guys have looked in those, the, the elevation profiles and tokens. You can do that at home on the computer. What's um, the website again? The, the website is Northwest Mountain School. And they're in Leavenworth, Washington. And uh, yeah, if you, they're, they're great folks too. Super, super nice. And, um, yeah, so they, they put all this on their website. Um, you can, Become a, a you know, whatever a follower of their blog, and you'll get their updates and all that. That's fun. So they they offer. They're they've done the AMGA. Olivia is one of uh, just a handful of women that are IFMGA certified guides, and they offer trips over to Europe. And they're they're definitely sort of doing the model of the independent guide service, um, husband and wife team. Anybody else? Question? So how is this? Is this kind of a general, or is this kind of the fast people type of thing? This is general. This is the, okay, so that's a good question. So that's, that's this technique right here. Um, so, you know, this, this time right here, this is, not a, uh, this is not a record setting time. I mean, we're talking about doing a climb in almost 24 hours. Like, who would, that, I mean, that's barely in a day, right? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, um, so all I'm doing here is, I, I haven't done anything special. I've just taken a climb of the Grand Teton and I took out all the excess time where we just sit around and we're just moving the whole time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I like, you, you would have a lot of these same time estimates if you climbed with Jackson Hole Mountain Guides or XM Mountain Guides, you know, and you did these legs, you'd be doing them in the same amount of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other questions? Just a couple of other slides after this and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and I'll let you guys go. <laughs>
Okay. You guys are okay? All right. I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I expected that we'd be able to take a break for 30 minutes, and you guys, I obviously didn't do a dry run of this first. But, um, but if you guys are fine, I'm, I'm happy to keep talking too. And, and we can do the exercise, and we're, we're set up to do it. If some of you guys want to try it out, uh, I'm happy to do that too. And other folks can go home. We can well, get Larry's the real time keeper. What do you think, Larry? He's looking at the clock right there. <laughs> um, did you have uh, Kevin Speak set up on your? Well, yeah. I mean, I'll just I'll finish the show. Yeah. Rather than you know, as we talked about before, breaking up into groups, because I think that's what yeah. I'm thinking, that's, that's the part that I would say just skip. go ahead and just yep. go through it very quickly. And stay okay. on stage on so, so, And so there's you, another thing too that everybody has to deal with on some of these trips, and that's dealing with fear with someone. Who is that can do it? Yep. That you can help do it yep. pretty easily dealing with their fear. And that's and that's something boy. Yeah. Anyway. It takes it there there's some people like I had a I had a um, a, a father and daughter on Rainier and the daughter was uh, maybe like well, she was probably like fourteen years old or something. Just you know like on the surface appearance, I just thought, too young, you know, like, I, I mean, but she did fine on the walk up to Camp Muir, everything seemed to be going great, and then at some point, um, you know, she, in the dark, going up the cleaver, it, you know, it just all was just oh, too overwhelming for her, and, and she just, she broke down in tears, and it was, you know, it just was like, it's done, we're not going to push you on, and a lot of people, you know, it, you just feel like, okay, you know, like, you can keep going, and, and that's a decision that, as a guide or coordinator, you have to make carefully because the further up you push somebody like that, then the more your responsibility they become um, because they're going further than they were comfortable with on your, uh, you know, encouragement, and and that can just be—it's just a weight you have to carry. Sometimes it works out great if it's just like, oh yeah, just get through this step. I know the rest of the way is pretty cruiser and it won't be a big deal. Just put your foot here yep. and then put your exactly, foot there. Yeah. I'm right behind you. Yeah. Okay, so here's Heaven's Peak um, sort of snapshot. There's the, the going to the Sun Road and um, and the idea was, you know, I, I think you probably park somewhere in here. I, I don't know very well enough, but uh, and then you need to cross the creek. And then you're gonna, and it's a 5,000 foot day, so it's it's big as far as elevation gain goes, and um, and it's all off trail. So, but you're going up a creek bed, you know, so it's not a total bushwhack. Um, and then you're gonna get up here, and then you need to find some sort of weakness in this uh, ridge here to gain the ridge, and then up the ridge, and then this, and you, from here you need to make sure that this stuff is, you know, um, melted, dissipated enough that it's not like it does not hang fire. Is what I would call it sitting up here, like big, well, medium sized chunks of snow that look like they might topple and roll down, you know, the slabs and stuff. Um, and that goes for up here as well, though you might not be able to see that from here. You, with a pair of binoculars, you could probably scope this out pretty well. Um, and then you got this ridge, and it looks like there's some slab climbing up here too that could be kind of spicy um, depending on the condition it's in. Um, so here's how I started. Uh, and, and I have, I, so what I have is um, some printed out spreadsheets that, that I made copies for you guys. You guys can take these with you and just apply it to your next client if you want or, or try this at home. My first leg is the car and I just, I give myself like a waypoint basically. This is um, UTM, it's a Universal Transverse Mercadian System. It's kind of like Latin Launch. If you needed a, a waypoint, you could plug it in here. For the purposes of these kinds of climbs, in general, I don't think it's entirely necessary, but, but in, some, in some ways, if you like using a GPS, it's nice. So, so in other words, you can plug a, a waypoint in here, you can pull those off a map without actually having been there if you have the training. But I, then I give myself an elevation at my starting point. And then the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to Ford McDonald Creek, but we're not really going to go anywhere. That's just a time suck. Like, I'm just... I gotta stop. Everyone's gotta stop. Take their shoes off. Roll their pants up. Figure out some way to keep everything dry. Walk across the creek. Not fall in. Get on the other side. Dry their feet off. You know, like it's just a process, right? So, 
how long, I don't know, how long you guys, how long would you budget for that? And let's say you have a group of uh, six people. Uh, 30, 30 minutes. 20 minutes. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what I thought. I figured 30 minutes, I could be wrong. It could take 45, I don't know. I mean, you know, who knows? Someone might have major issues, but you, that's okay. You don't have to plan for every contingency. Um, but I would, what I would shy away from is, is I wouldn't give yourself um, less time, you know, because, uh, yeah, just, just, just pad it. Then, okay, so, so I don't put anything in here for this, although I would have put here estimated time 30 minutes. Um, and then this, the running time column is going to be for your, your, it's sort of like you want to add each time up. So 30 minutes here gives me 4 hours and 30 minutes here, gives me, you know, 4 hours and 30 plus whatever the next leg is here, that kind of thing. Um, and the units I put in here is sort of just to give an example of the math. So three kilometers, 994 meters is basically a thousand meters. So again, I'm rounding up. Um, and then I divide that by four, or I'm sorry, I, I add those together, I get 13 units. I divide it by four and I don't know, let's see, actually, I think it's right here. Um, yeah, I, didn't even, I didn't write it here either. Well, I get something that's close to four hours. I'm sure I round it up for that too. Um, and, and then I think, let's see, did I? Top of the basin. Okay, so when I did four hours for that, I also budgeted in three 15 minute breaks. Um, and I didn't plot those out on the map. So basically what I'm doing here is uh, car, cross the creek, stop. Okay, next leg is from here all the way up to, I don't know, somewhere in here. That's a long distance, right? So I'm saying it's gonna take me four hours to get up here. A lot of stuff could happen in here. I mean, I have no idea what this terrain is like or, you know, I mean, who knows, right? Lots of things. So to make it more accurate, you would break this up into smaller chunks. And especially if you knew kind of like, okay, well, there's a cliff band here or there's a stream crossing there and, it, you know, that just takes more time, then you could, you know, create another waypoint. Or you could create, a, if you knew where you wanted to take your breaks, you could create those. But for the sake of kind of getting some numbers, I just said, okay, we're gonna, we're climbing that stream bed, regardless of what route we take up it. And I'm guessing it's gonna take me four hours. And in that time, I'll take three breaks of 15 minutes each. And so that's an extra 45 minutes. Does that make sense? So I budgeted the breaks into that time there. And then I would keep going. So top of the basin, and, and I filled the rest of it out here. And so the idea was that, you know, we would kind of fill out the rest together, but um, for another time. Does anybody have questions about sort of how that goes together? I know it's like... Good idea. <clears throat> yeah, I'm honestly, really. I've never done something to that extent so I will from now on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm flattered. And we're going to hand out a topo in. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the pieces of the project. All, like, especially on our trips we don't do through the club that are more extensive where we want to be a little more selective. We do most of this on the GPS, and, but I definitely like this. It's a lot of the, the thing, that when you get comfortable doing this, the thing that you'll find is that you, the other parts of trip planning start to uh, take form. So like deciding what kind of gear you're gonna bring, figuring out how much weight you're gonna be carrying to be able to accomplish these times and you know, these incremental goals. It, you know, it just all sort of starts to be like, oh, yeah, okay, so, you know, if you start doing these and you realize that, like, hey, you know, when I'm doing a day climb of, you know, Clements, it doesn't take me four hours to get up to here. It only takes, and that's because I'm, I have a day pack on. You know, like, this four hours, this is like, this is a thousand feet an hour, plus 15 minute breaks, you know, it's like, it's a nice, cushy time. So what I came up with a total was um, 13 hours round trip. So eight and a half hours to the summit, and that includes a 30 minute break on the summit and then you know, 13 hours back down to the car. So it, it ends up being a big day. If you left at you know, 6 a.m. from the car, you're gonna be back at the car at 7 p.m. You know, and you can figure if it's anything like my other time plan, it'll be 8 p.m. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, yeah. So, okay, uh, so takeaway points, style matters, take care of people, SPF, 
shelter pace and food and professionalism. And that's it. Cool. Thanks, you guys. I, I appreciate you letting me. I, I, you know, obviously, I enjoy this talking about stuff, which is why you I was like psyched that Don asked me to do this. And you know, whenever you present, you learn some things too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Presenting, and you can see your excitement. Though. It's wonderful. Yeah, good. Um, do you have those handouts? Before I do. Uh, are they on the back? Okay. okay. All right. So people can pick those up. I'm going to turn it over to Larry because he's going to talk about tomorrow. Um, how many are planning on meeting uh, early in the morning on Big Mountain? I guess how many are just here for today? Okay, just a couple. All right. Then there will be some who come tomorrow who are here today. Thing, but maybe not. All right, Larry. I think Phyllis is probably somewhat marginal. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll probably just focus on ice axe. Probably some fresh milk there or some cramp running isn't going to be a, a real uh, good thing to, to uh, practice. So and I don't know what we're going to get for the weather. We could get some storms, we could get some rain, sun could pop out. Um, so we'll go up there, um, just see how it goes. Um, if uh, everyone is uh, comfortable, we can find some good places. We'll uh, you know, spend a couple hours. If uh, it's miserable up there, well, we'll go have uh, coffee and donuts. <laughs> so, anyway, I think if we, uh, Are try, you going to hike up the east route? What's that? Are you going to hike up the east route? We're going to hike up the big ravine. Okay. So which part do you want to be? What's that? Which part do you want to be? Uh, which, it's, it's, on the, it's on the calendar, on the description. It's, does everyone know how to get to the meeting place, meeting point? Yeah. Everyone's good? Okay. Great. So 7, 7 to 7, 15. Well, yeah, you can get there by then. If you're not, to use a Steve Bird term, if you're not a putzer, you can jump out of your car and go. You know, 7, 15 is good. If you need a little prep time, get there a little earlier so we can start. And I stuck snowshoes in my truck this morning. Um, if there's that much snow, which I doubt. It was about just maybe three or four inches of wet snow. Were you up there? Today? Yeah. So you'll be able to packing. You'll be able to move packing. If it freezes overnight, you know, you might actually use the crampons, otherwise you'll just be able to. I'm gonna bring it all in the car yeah. and then we can make the decision at the uh, parking lot. They were predicting 25 degrees in whitefish tonight. Yeah, so it's going to be cold. So it's bring, bring the crampons. I would say yeah, winter, winter, winter clothes. Uh, crampons or yak track, something for for low traction if it does freeze up pretty good. And obviously ice axe. <laughs> Anything else, Robert? <laughs> as far as that? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, the, inclement weather. Yeah, because we don't, you know, if you want to bring snowshoes, bring snowshoes, and it may be useful to, to uh, pack down some snow and create some areas where right. more you slide, can slide right. pretty easily. That's, you may or may not need them. Yeah, the, the plan is to kind of run through a, a sort of a pseudo snow school like we, like we do with folks on Rainier, um, but just kind of like, Go through all the different positions of an ice axe arrest, so you know, like sitting on your back and all that kind of stuff. And, and if people are flying through it, we'll just keep moving. Then we can go into you know uh, climbing techniques for using the ice axe. If the cramponing is good, we'll definitely talk about uh, cramponing. You know, just a proper French technique and the different styles of climbing. Um, you know, snow slopes with crampons on and chopping steps if we want. And, you know, yeah. The, I think we will. We're not just going to be one big herd up there, people flying everywhere. I think we'll we'll split up into maybe uh, five or six smaller groups. And there's quite a few people here who have had a lot of experience. They've done the Cascade volcanoes and so forth, so they can be kind of a subgroup leader. And uh, Robert can tour go yeah. from from group to group and, and help out as needed. That's the plan. All right, well, again, we'll see you tomorrow, bright and early on Big Mouth.